Welcome back to another discussion on the Lord's Recovery Unchained. Would you like to know what Witnessly claimed? Witnessly claimed there is no new light anywhere except from him. In his own ministry, Witnessly says, look around at the entire situation of Christianity today. Where are the revelation and the vision? Outside the Lord's Recovery, there is no light. And he also said there is only one blueprint and one master builder in the proper correct building. The only master builder is the architect who has the blueprint in his hand. All those who do not build, speak, or serve according to the blueprint released by the Lord through that man are void of light and revelation and are not serving according to the vision. Today in the Lord's recovery, some are preaching and publishing messages. The portions in their messages that impart light, revelation, and the life supply invariably derive their source from this ministry, meaning his own, in the Lord's recovery. Other than those portions, there is no revelation or vision in their writings taken together, and they are only two paragraphs away from each other, so it's perfectly kosher to take them together. These excerpts bring us to two unavoidable conclusions. There is no light, revelation, or vision in Christianity, and there is no light, revelation, or vision in the Lord's recovery outside of Witness Lee's ministry. So what's left after you put the kibosh on everyone else? Witness Lee's ministry only. Kind of a convenient teaching for some Someone who makes a living off the sale of that ministry, don't you think? The conclusion the reader is forced to come to is that the only light anywhere on earth is found in Witness Lee's ministry and in his ministry alone. Woo-wee! Can you imagine looking your fellow brothers and sisters in the eye, your church family, the ones you should be encouraging? and instead telling them they have nothing to offer and that God isn't giving them any light at all? And can you imagine actually meaning it? Can you imagine telling people that if they don't do what you say, God won't give them any light? As if right standing with you is a requirement for their relationship with God. Is this the arrogant attitude of someone you actually want to follow? Because in 1 John 1.5, the Bible clearly says that God is light. And then we've got this guy, Jesus, the Son of God, in John 8, 12, who says that he is the light of the world. And then Witness Lee announces that he is the light, and no one has any light besides him. Saints, it is beyond me how this kind of speaking from Witness Lee hasn't registered to you as a huge red flag. This is the kind of speaking of a self-proclaimed Christian leader with a massive Jupiter-sized God complex. This is the kind of speaking you expect to hear from cult leaders, not from godly Christian men. And I'm not making this up at all. He preserved this stuff in his own printed ministry. Ah. So as an example of Witness Lee's ministry not actually having all the light, let's talk about Laodicea. I'm thinking of these verses in Revelation which say to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing, but you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich, and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness, and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. So note the apparently strange thing the Lord says in verse 15. He doesn't say, I wish you were hot. He says, I wish you were either one or the other. The Lord wishes that they were either hot or or cold. And he says it again, because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Let's look at how Watchman Nee tries to grapple with these verses. He says, you are neither cold nor hot. They are not in one of the two categories. They are sitting exactly in between them. A corpse is cold and a living person is hot. 
These ones are not cold, hence they are not dead in sin. They have been enlivened by the life of God. However, they are not hot either. They have departed from the first love. Their condition is somewhat abnormal. They are living, yet they have caught a cold. The world is a freezing cold enclave, and the air there is forever wintry. When they take the risk to take their place there, it is inevitable that they will catch a cold? If believers hope that the world will not try them like a furnace, they have to expect the world to freeze them like an ice house. Under such circumstances, all light and heat will naturally and gradually be put out. The heart must be hot for Christ. Only this will please the Lord. I honestly don't even know how to track his train of thought there. He jumps from a corpse to someone who has caught a cold to a mysterious freezing cold enclave to wintry air to a furnace to an ice house. Watchman Nee equates being cold with being in a worldly condition and he calls being cold being dead in sin. I'm not sure I can get behind agreeing that God was actually wishing his people were dead in sin and worldly. Can you? I mean, this basically describes describes God's problems with his people throughout most of the Old Testament, so this would be a radical departure from how God spoke to his people all before this in the Bible. Saints and listeners, this is clearly the conclusion of someone who is casting around, unable to get a grip on what actually is going on in the verses. Nee concluded that only a hot heart will please the Lord. But as we know, this isn't what those verses say, because the Lord says he wishes they were either hot or cold. In this next excerpt, Watchman Nee acknowledges coldness is preferred over lukewarmness, but then equates coldness with sin and corruption, shockingly saying that God would prefer the sin of Jezebel over someone simply being lukewarm. Kind of speechless. So let's fast forward to what Witness Lee has to say. He says, why was the church in Laodicea so lukewarm? It is simply because she was too much in the mind. If Christians are lukewarm, it is certain that they are too much in the mind. They have too many doctrines and too much knowledge. Romans 12.11 tells us the only way to keep from being lukewarm be burning in spirit. We must forget about the teachings and doctrines as well as our clear and clever mind. We need to be burned in our spirit. Notice that the letter to Laodicea never says anything like they are in their mind, and yet Witnessly takes another opportunity to pound it into you that knowledge is a scary thing, that you should get out of your mind, and that you should forget about your clear mind. For all the reasons why this is incredibly problematic and unbiblical, please watch the video on this channel where we test the teaching in the Lord's Recovery on getting out of your mind. The link is in the description below. It's one of the most unbiblical things out there. And once again, notice that he only focuses on the burned, i.e. the hot, part of Laodicea and never says anything like we must be frigid or freezing, even though the Lord said he wished they were hot or cold. Why? I'll give you one more from Witness Lee to hammer it home. He says, being neither cold nor hot, the degraded church is in danger of being spewed out of the Lord's mouth, that is, losing the enjoyment of all that the Lord is to his church. Hence, she needs to repent of her lukewarmness and be zealous, boiling, burning, that she may regain her enjoyment of the reality of Christ. Okay, now it's starting to bug me. Why do they focus on the sin of lukewarmness, repeatedly say they need to be burning and boiling, but keep evading what that whole cold thing is doing in the verse? Well, it's because neither of them knows. They don't know, so they dance around it and avoid it. But you know who does know what the co-workers would call evil Christianity. The rest of the body of Christ that the Lord's recovery wants nothing to do with. All those other Christians that the co-workers have made clear you should keep the bridges burned to. They know. They figured it out. They didn't close their ears to new revelations. They didn't close up shop saying there's no new light out there and we have it all. Do you want to know what the deal is with God wishing the church in Laodicea was either hot or cold? 
Well, Laodicea was a very wealthy city in the Lycus Valley and was located on two major trade routes. They were well known for producing high quality black wool. They were also famous for their school of medicine and for the production of a medicinal eye salve known as Phrygian powder. Laodicea was so wealthy that when a massive earthquake hit in 60 AD, it refused Rome's offer for help to rebuild their city and they rebuilt their city themselves. Self-sufficient, wealthy, proud, rich. But Laodicea wasn't alone in the Lycus Valley. Six miles to the north of Laodicea was a town called Hierapolis. Hierapolis was known for its hot springs and day spas. People came from all over to visit Hierapolis to go to the large public baths filled with hot mineral water. And by the way, they still do to this day. And guess what? Nine miles to the east of Laodicea was a town called Colossae. Colossae was at the foot of Mount Cadmus and enjoyed an endless supply of cold, fresh water coming down from the snow caps. This watered the crops and the flocks there. So why does this matter? Well, for all its wealth, fame, and self-reliance, Laodicea lacked something water. It didn't have a good water source, so they built aqueducts that piped water in, but even then, by the time the water made it to them, it was in bad shape. Expositor's Bible Commentary says, A six-mile-long aqueduct brought Laodicea its supply of water. The water came either from hot springs and was cooled to lukewarm, or came from a cooler source and warmed up in the aqueduct on the way. For all its wealth, the city had poor water. So when the Lord tells the church in Laodicea that he wishes they were either cold or hot, they immediately would understand what he meant because they dealt daily with lukewarm, gross, useless, tepid, stale water that used to be cold or hot, but by the time it got to them was neither cold nor hot. So what are hot springs? Revitalizing, healing, comforting, useful. What is the cold fresh water? Refreshing, good for drinking, cooking, bathing, useful. What is lukewarm water? Gross, stagnant, nasty, emetic, useless. The Lord didn't say to be cold is better than hot or to be hot is better than cold. He just said he wished they were either one of them. He wished they were good for something, useful for something, refreshing for those who needed refreshing, healing for those who needed healing, just not lukewarm and useless, just not vomit worthy. You know, like the nasty water bottle left in your car that you desperately open after a long run and it's lukewarm? Blech. All of this would be like God saying to a group of believers in Anaheim, you think you are happy, but I counsel you to come to me so you could be in the realest, happiest place on earth. Anyone living in Anaheim would immediately understand the reference to Disneyland, which is located in Anaheim and known as the happiest place on earth. And notice what the Lord specifically says in the verse, I know your deeds that you are neither cold nor hot. He's talking about their deeds. Now I'm more than willing to admit that this is my own personal reading here, but do you know what comes to mind when I think of cold or hot deeds? When I think of deeds that are revitalizing, healing, comforting, refreshing, and useful, I think of all the good works and deeds that the ministry in the local church speaks derisively of and spits on. You know, all those things that the rest of the churches in all the cities besides the local church do in that city. Things like food pantries, homeless shelters, women's ministries, prison outreach, aid with adoption services, caring for the sick in hospitals, caring for the city's youth. You know, those kind of useful deeds that the ministry in the local church completely abhors. Kind of makes you think, huh? Not only that, but the other commercial aspects I mentioned earlier play into the rest of the verses in Revelation regarding Laodicea. Does anything further stick out? Because they did have riches and they did have gold. They were known for their wealth to the point they were self-sufficient in a destructive crisis. And yet the Lord is counseling them to buy gold from him because their physical riches meant nothing. They were famous for producing luxurious black wool, but the Lord counsels them to obtain white clothes from him 
so they can actually be clothed. They were known far and wide for their famous eye salve that cured many ailments, but the Lord advises them to get eye salve from him to put on their eyes so they can actually see. All the things they had, all the riches and fame and wealth, all those things they were proud of, the Lord knew about all of it, and yet he told them they were wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. These specific references to the city of Laodicea shows the Lord truly knew them and their life. He knew their daily reality. Saints, do the verses in Revelation make some more sense to you now? Do they have more impact now? But let's look at the way Ni handles some of this. He says, There is only one group of proud people, those who were Philadelphia and who had once kept God's word and not denied his name. Yet the life which they once had is lost. They still remember their history, but they have lost their former life. They remember that they were once wealthy and had become rich and had need of nothing, but they are now poor and blind. There is only one group of people who can boast of their riches, fallen Philadelphia, the Philadelphia which has lost its power and life. Nee tries to say that since he believes Laodicea is a fallen and formed Philadelphia, that Laodicea used to be rich and no longer was, and the Lord was trying to tell them their current true situation. But that's not the case, as we've seen. Laodicea isn't a fallen, formerly rich Philadelphia. The Laodiceans were literally rich at the time. That's the point. They didn't used to be rich. They were actually rich. And yet the Lord was still telling them they were poor. I mean, imagine God walking up to Bill Gates or Warren Buffett and telling them they are poor. This kind of thing would get your attention. So, saints, what do you think? While admittedly this isn't some blinding revelation, do we still want to believe that Ni nee and Lee have all the light, or well, there is no new light out there? Of course not! Don't tell me for one second that there is no new light out there beyond Ni nee or Lee's ministry, or that anything else is impure or leaven or dark or poison. There absolutely is light and information and understanding and revelation from many other sources besides the ministry in the local churches, the very ministry that got a lot of things terribly wrong. And you won't have to feel like you're reading the works of two guys still casting around for comprehension right in front of your face. Two guys telling you not to use your clear and sober mind and jumping around from corpses to catching colds to furnaces which have nothing to do with those verses or with Laodicea at all. And if you're a Christian, why would you shy away from anything that gives you a clearer or sharper understanding of the Bible? Saints, nothing false is made true because Witnessly says it, and things that are true are true regardless of whether Witnessly said it or not. Witnessly is not the arbiter, determiner, or holder of the truth. He is not the source of light. You might proclaim you agree, but it's time you actually started believing it and acting like it. Saints and listeners, God is much bigger than Witness Lee. He's not a stingy God. He reveals himself in more ways than we can imagine. I mean, can you imagine claiming there is no new light outside of what you have to say? What kind of God complex, what kind of arrogance, what kind of inflated self-importance must you possess to make that kind of deluded claim like Witness Lee? did. Anyone who speaks like that needs to be all the more distrusted, tested, and examined before you accept anything he says as true. Saints, there is life and light beyond the stagnant, tepid, lukewarm ministry in the local church, beyond the ministry from which each of you know there is nothing new because its source has been dead for over 25 years, beyond the ministry that has simply been repeating the same old thing every time now, in every conference, every training, for decades, and you are missing out on all of it.